start sir good morning uh, good afternoon and good evening all of you this is wsp os 4 worldwide webinar the main intention of this webinar is teach and learn which is the both the sides of the same coin uh, according to indian philosophy there is a saying vasudeva kutumbakam that means the entire world is one family and right now many of you are watching from different parts of the world i want to welcome all of you to this webinar before introducing today's uh, panelist i have some housekeeping announcement number 1 i request all of you to open this uh, uh, browser on your browser www.menti.com this is an interactive uh, forum where there will be questions and the passcode for today is 956535 throughout the webinar i'll be asking some questions which you will see in your browser so this is the menti.com if you type in menti.com you will see that and you need to add 956535 at the passcode and submit when you submit you will see the questions and some of you might have an access to qr code you can even use this qr code for the same so this question this uh, the browser you should not close it keep it open frequently whenever i change my questions you will see on your mobile phone browser and there are three uh, live uh, uh, lines today one is blueberry second one is facebook and the third one is youtube for the blueberry viewers you can type in your questions as and when it comes to your mind you can type in next to that for the facebook and youtube we can put your comments there uh, that questions will be sent to us but for some reason you are not able to send your questions you can email to us on wspos at wspos.org this has to be done within 1 hour of the webinar so we can try to answer we will try to answer as many questions as possible by the panel today but definitely all the questions cannot be answered in this webinar so we will uh, send a pdf at a later date uh, today's panel uh, the first discussant is dr shon dai he is a director of uh, ophthalmology in the queens children's eye hospital brisbane australia he is also president of australia and new zealand strabismus society we are very glad to have him today our next speaker is dr david hunter who did his uh, uh, ophthalmic uh, residency from massa and i here and then fellowship at wilmer he stayed on there as a faculty for almost 10 years before he moved to boston currently he is the chief of ophthalmology as well as director and vice chair of ophthalmology at harvard medical school he is also a co-founder of reborn uh we have the next speaker dr virendra sachdeva he is a consultant in elu prasada institute visakhapatnam he did this first fellowship in elu prasada institute followed by a clinical research fellowship in neuroophthalmology in emory university his areas of inter interest are complex strabismus imaging in strabismus and also neuroophthalmology i have the pleasure of introducing my co moderator today dr yair morat who is a professor of ophthalmology uh, at the uh, uh, university and also head of uh, uh, center in pediatric ophthalmology services he is also head of uh, israel school of orthoptics and he is a member of scientific bureau of wspos and he served in the past in the research unit of uh, israel uh, defense force before passing on to uh, dr morad you can see on your menti screen you can see the next question coming up you can answer it and i will hand it over to dr yair morad now 
Thank you, Ramesh. So, for, for anyone of you who do or not know Ramesh, Ramesh Kakunaya is the head of the Child Sight Institute in Hyderabad, uh, in India. He's also a member of the WSPOS uh, Scientific Committee, and he's doing a lot of work in the WSPOS. And his special interests are complex business, pediatric cataracts, and pediatric neuroophthalmology. Can I have the next slide, Ramesh? And across the border from here in Egypt, we have Ahmed Awadin. He's a professor of ophthalmology in Cairo University. Uh, he's, uh, he's working as in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus uh, in the Cairo University Children's Hospital. And he's the secretary general and board member of the Egyptian Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. Next on the crew is Kyle Arnoldi. He's associate professor in the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Buffalo in the US. He's an orthoptist, a chief orthoptist in the Ross Eye Institute and the program director in the orthoptic uh, REI orthoptic fellowship program. She's the editor in chief of the Journal of Binocular Vision and Ocular Motility is in the American representative to the International Orthoptic Association Council, uh, Council of Management. And last but not least is my mentor, Stephen Kraft, from, uh, from the University of Toronto and for the, the sick, from the Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. He's a professor of ophthalmology in the Department of Ophthalmology and the Faculty of Medicine, University of Toronto. And his strabismus practice is evenly divided between adults and childhood strabismus. And uh, actually, uh, David, uh, sorry, Stephen, is our first speaker. I would like uh, to introduce him as the first speaker. Is he go he he's going to speak about resection, uh, resecting the lateral rectus in isotropic brain syndrome. It can be very useful and safe. Go ahead, Stephen. When uh, Dr. Steve Kraft is setting up his presentation, we have changed the menti.com questions. There are two more questions will come. You can answer at your uh, time. Dr. Kraft, all yours. Oh, just a minute, stop share. Well, it's, uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You can hear it. Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, say welcome and uh, hello world. It's uh, wonderful to have uh, people from all around the, all the different time zones and thank you for joining us. And it's a pleasure to be involved in this uh, webinar. And um, you know that all the work that we do audio wise will actually be transmitted beyond earth out into outer space so that in thousands of years, there'll be extraterrestrials who will hear this seminar about Duane syndrome. So I'd like to issue a challenge to David and to Ken and all the group uh, in WSPOS that uh, you guys have conquered the world. And I'm gonna suggest that we start a new society called the Universal Society for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, which we can call the USPOS. <laughs> and I challenge you to start this new enterprise. And that enterprise is actually an important word. I don't have any financial disclosures, but I just want to show you the Aurora Borealis or Northern Lights from outer space from the International Space Station. First of all, we have uh, Dr. Ramesh uh, allowed me to give a few slides and intro introductory slides here for um, the introduction to Duane syndrome. And what I wanted to do is first of all, since we have many uh, young trainees uh, who are um, just starting out in the specialty or many of you who are not uh, <clears throat> necessarily specialists in the area, to introduce a few concepts since we have a worldwide audience to start some new trends and to eliminate some old ones. The first is that it's very common in around the world that people um, classify Duane syndrome into three narrow uh, types. I would like to suggest that we stop this practice. 
because if you look back at Huber's paper that this is based on. Interrupt. Can I yes. interrupt? Can you can yes. you share your screen, please? Is it not shared? Yeah, not yet. Not yet. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, Didn't get to see the aurora borealis. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm just gonna have to go back here. I'm sorry. Um, Share screen. When Dr. Kraft is sharing the screen, all of you can see the mentee questions. I request everybody to answer as many as possible. Thank you. Now we can see uh, Dr. Kraft. Now you can see it. Okay. I just have to. Sorry. This I just. Is uh, full screen now. Is this better? Good. Okay. So what I was saying is that I would like to stop using this Huber classification because it's a very narrow. Um, uh, look at the spectrum of what we call Duane syndrome. And these are specific types that are very pure types and don't re really reflect the uh, variety and the spectrum of this disease. What I wanted to show you is a different EMG study and there's nothing better than showing the active dynamic innervation of the muscles of the eye when they're all being uh, recorded. This is Dr. Alan Scott and Guy Wong, who uh, many years ago, this is almost 50 years ago, showed EMGs where all of the muscles were being recorded. And you can see that going from abduction to adduction, that all these third nerve innervated muscles are being activated along with the medial and lateral rectus. And this actually is beautifully gels with the anatomy studies that were uh, done on patients with Duane syndrome. These are post-mortem cadaver specimens. This is from an original study in Italy that shows you the lateral rectus innervated by the sixth nerve. But when it was cut away, you could see that the third nerve sent branches to both the medial and lateral rectus. And this actually tells you that depending on the relative innervation of the third nerve to these muscles, you can have various types of innervation and disinnervation, and it would mean that there's actually a spectrum. And that's what I want our young colleagues and uh, uh, around the world to realize that this is a spectrum of the congenital cranial disinformation disorders, the CCDDs, just like we saw three weeks ago where Dr. Schenner beautifully showed the um, patients with uh, the congenital fibrosis of the extraocular muscles, which is also a CCDD that is also a spectrum. These diseases all have various innervation patterns, and I would suggest we not classify them, but rather look at their clinical features because there is no single menu for surgery, and each case has to be individualized as far as their surgical plan. Just so that everybody is on the same page, I'm gonna be referring to relative duction gradings to show you in abduction, this patient is normal. This is minus one. Minus two is about a 50% limitation. Minus three just gets into the field. And minus four is complete inability to enter into that uh, field of action. So this will give you a reference for the gradings that I'll be referring to later. So I said that this is a spectrum, a spectrum from esotropia to ortho to exotropia. Its retraction can be mild, moderate, or severe. Dr. Murad will deal with this in his case uh, shortly. You can have up and down shoots that can be mild, moderate, or severe. The abduction gradings can be anywhere from full to minus four, or complete inability to abduct. Adduction similarly can be variable from minus four out to full. And the field of binocular single vision in some cases is narrow and in some cases wide, and we try to preserve or try to improve this with our decision of what surgery to do. So here's the summary of those features. And I would like to, going forward for our universal society here to look at these as the markers of how we approach a Duane syndrome case. The compensatory head posture, heterotropia, the range of adduction, abduction, and verticals, as Dr. Sajdeva will dis, uh, discuss, the retraction, upshoot, downshoot, and whether it's mechanical or innervational, there are two different forms. 
and uh, the range of single vision and whether it's in one eye or bilateral, it's not infrequent to see the syndrome bilateral. Now, while I said that we're not going to call certain types, there are certain types of Duane syndrome in the spectrum that are fairly common. And the one I'm going to deal with is the one that has an esotropia in primary position with limited abduction, as you see in this young lady with a compensatory head posture, which is a very common feature. There are many different strategies to deal with this condition, depending on the severity of the different features that I mentioned. And uh, Dr. Hunter, who follows me, will discuss the uh, number two, the uh, vertical uh, uh, transpositions, but uh, simpler surgeries can also be effective. But what I wanted to discuss and now to hone in on my topic is the recess and resect procedure. Now, those of you that were trained a number of years ago and uh, still studying in the subject will notice this book. They'll recognize Dr. Von Norden and Dr. Campos' book. And we heard some lovely talks from Dr. Campos just a couple of weeks ago. But in there, the last edition of this book, there's a statement there that the resection of the lateral rectus in Duane's type one should be avoided under any circumstances because it can compromise adduction. Now, if that's in his textbook, the problem is that they were not referring to the discussion that I'm going to give you because what Dr. Von Norden and Dr. Campos were implying is that if you do the usual amounts of resection or what's commonly done now, plication, for the same angle of a routine esotropia, which would be five to seven to eight millimeters, this is what they were referring to. And I had a long talk with Dr. Von Norden about this. And when I showed him the data that I'm gonna show you, he was quite intrigued and was preparing to change this paragraph. Unfortunately, he passed on before he could make a seventh edition, but it would have been changed had he written this textbook uh, in the future. And the first, we have to give credit where credit is due. The first person who I was aware of that mentioned resections of a lateral in Duane's was James Mims III, our illustrious out of the box thinker colleague in uh, San Antonio, Texas. And when Yair Morad was a fellow with us in Toronto, and I must say he had boyish looks there and he still looks like a young gentleman. Uh, he hasn't changed in 20 years, but uh, he um, was my uh, fellow and we called Dr. Mims and we put together nine patients in whom we did recess resects of these amounts. And we had excellent results in primary position, but there seemed to be a cutoff at around four millimeters of resection beyond which you worsen the retraction. So Dr. Von Norden, Dr. Campos were right. However, if you restrict the resection to less than that, you don't run into those problems. So here are a series of patients I wanted to share with you. Some of these I have reported in the past, but over a number of years in a prospective manner, I've gathered the 18 patients over the years of various ages with at least 10 months of follow-up, all with the form of Duane's of esotropia and limited abduction. And all of the patients had to have, in order to do this, I don't want our colleagues or younger colleagues thinking that this is the routine procedure I do for all ESO Duanes. You have to have at least 25 diopters in primary, less than 33% reduction of the lid fissure height. I'll show you how I classify this. We have to have clinically normal adduction or at maximum a very slight limitation at least minus three and a half abduction by the scale I showed you earlier, minimal or no up or down shoots and a positive force duction at surgery to justify doing the medial rectus. And in my Duane syndromes, I measure the lid fissure height going from primary position to adduction. To do this surgery safely, you have to have mild retraction, meaning that there's less than a one third change in millimeters on going from primary to adduction. So where on the spectrum is the Duane's patients that would be qualifying for this procedure? First of all, they have to have esotropia, a fairly large angle in Duane's uh, spectrum. Mild, no more than mild uh, ret retraction. Mild or no up or down shoots, meaning that the retraction phenomenon is very mild. They have to have at least three and a half to four on abduction minus minimal or no adduction limitation, and a moderate field of binocular single vision. So this is the category of patients that would work. And no patients I've done have a medial recess more than five, 
and the resection on the laterals in all these cases would be less than you would normally do because the length tension curve of these muscles is very different. Here is the cohort of patients to show you that all the lateral rectus resections were less than three, uh, were three and a half or less, no medial done more than five millimeters and the results were ex ex very, very satisfying. And you can see this is over follow-up up to five years. To summarize, the uh, patients had between 25 and 30 of ESO, average of 28. Post-op, the average was almost orthotropic. And look at the abduction improvement. With this mild resection, you get two grades of abduction improvement on average. And notice that two patients reached minus one abduction. That's three quarters of the range into normal abduction. And the adduction was minimally affected and certainly did not compromise uh, the patient's um, uh, daily activities. There, were, there was one induced vertical of three diopters that was asymptomatic. And in one patient who had a pre-existing hyper, I offset both muscles down to eliminate the hypertropia. To show you two case examples, here is one patient with a uh, 30 diopter esotropia and a minus three and a half abduction. And post-op, of course, I'm showing you my best result, but she had uh, orthotropia in primary position and she had a minus one on abduction. And just to show you that the results are not unique to North America, I had permission from our illustrious colleague, Andrea Molinari in Quito, Ecuador, who sent me pictures of one of her early patients that she did this procedure, a young lady with an esotropia of 35 diopters and minus four abduction. She did this procedure and you can see that postoperatively orthotropia with a minus two on abduction. Now, I just want to finish uh, to compare this procedure to a couple of the other procedures that uh, are quite popular, one that Dr. Hunter will, will um, discuss, and uh, that is the superior rectus lateral transposition plus medial recession, which is an SRT and MR recess. And this is the full tendon transpositions with the foster, which is called the foster procedure or FTT and myopexy. And if you compare these various procedures and medial rectus recessions, another popular procedure to recess the medials of one or both eyes, you can see that the MR recess and lateral resect at the bottom compares very favorably with these other procedures. But I have to say again, that it has a specific nature of Duane's for which this would be used. The um, major transpositions were done in patients with larger esotropias. So they have a role as well as Dr. Hunter will discuss. The abduction improvements, the most improved was with the recess and resect, but all of these procedures did improve the abduction and the compromise in adduction was not severe with any and very mild with the recess and resect. So I'm almost done. This is where the wall, Great Wall of China actually ends after several thousand kilometers. So it's safe to do this procedure with at least 25 of ESO, mild globe retraction, clinically normal adduction, abduction at least minus three and a half, no or minimal up or down shoots, and a positive force duction. The advantages of it, it's a predictable correction of ESO in the head turn, almost no risk of creating a new vertical tropia. You can also correct a hypertropia by offsetting muscles. There's a minimal risk of creating torsion. You can improve abduction in almost all cases and it's reversible if you have to. And since we're here from around the world, I'd like to say thank you. And this will cover about 80% of the uh, world's languages. Uh, nice to be with you. And now in honor of the universal society that our gentlemen are going and, and ladies will create, I'd like to ask the panelists and they will get a prize if they can tell me to whom these thank yous are directed. Any takers? If you do, you get a prize from Canada the next time that we meet. Kaltok, Naira, and Lesek Shaya Tonat. Any takers? Okay, it's not, uh, I'm not gonna hold you up, but Katlo is Klingon for thank you. Kneira is Romulan for thank you. And Lesek Shaya Tonat is Vulcan for thank you. So we can include our extraterrestrials. And I just like to say to everybody that you should stay healthy and then you can live long 
and prosper. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for this uh, nice lecture and uh, tutorial on <laughs> different languages. And I'm sure your presentation will, will have a lot of questions and comments. But before we do that, I would like to uh, 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 go to David Hunter. And he's David Hunter uh, showed us the SRT, Spirit of Transposition Method, about 10 years ago, was it? And uh, since then, it changed a lot of the uh, way we are, we are uh, dealing with uh, Duane syndrome. And we'd like him to tell us more about this procedure. Go ahead, David. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Yair, and uh, to the uh, WSPOS for inviting me to participate. I have some financial disclosures that are not relevant to today's presentation. And uh, I'll tell you exactly when I started, because this is before I started doing uh, the SRT in April of 2006, I had a 13 month old girl who had esotropic Duane syndrome with a 10 prism diopter, esotropia and a 45 degree head turn. Now, having just heard that last talk, maybe she would have been a good candidate for recess or sec. No, because she had a good amount of globe retraction. But my, uh, my uh, practice at the time was to do what Art Rosenbaum had popularized, a full vertical rectus transposition with posterior augmentation suture. So I did that surgery. Then I left town to attend Arvo. And at Arvo, <clears throat> uh, at Arvo, I uh, encountered Earl Crouch standing at a poster where he was talking about just moving the superior rectus muscle laterally. And I, I actually stood at that poster for an hour saying, I just don't understand why are you doing this and how can you get away with it? And he said, well, I had done so many full transpositions and ended up with hypotropias, upgaze limitation that I decided if it's going to happen, if that's going to happen, I might as well just try moving one muscle and see what I get. So he presented 52 cases where he had really good results uh, and recommended it as primary procedure, but still, you know, seemed a little crazy. I went away, said, yeah, all that's all well and good. I went back home and uh, my patient that I told you about, she was doing pretty well, but, uh, but another by 16 months post-op, now she had great abduction from the transposition. Uh, however, she had a hypotropia in primary. She had limited elevation of the left eye. She had a chin up head posture. And I said, well, maybe this is a sign. I'll try Earl Crouch's procedure on the next patient. That worked really well. I tried it again, worked well, and I began to accumulate uh, a series. So I've shown this video before, but this is, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, but this is uh, basically how we, um, do this, uh, uh, isolate superior rectus muscle. I pre-placed the augmentation sutures. It makes it a little easier uh, later. And then uh, uh, when um, isolating superior rectus muscle, which we'll be seeing in a second, I make sure to clear levator and uh, attachments to superior oblique so we don't get in trouble. Then it's, uh, it's uh, uh, here I'm securing superior rectus muscle. It's important to mark the corners so you don't get lost. I've seen redone cases from elsewhere where the superior rectus muscle ended up recessed by accident. So you want to place your marks at the corners of the lateral and superior rectus muscle. So now we've re, uh, we've detached the muscle here, reattach back uh, in the uh, transposed uh, location. You see when we pull this up, there's a little gap there, but we have the pre-placed sutures for the augmentation suture. So tie those sutures down. Uh, that's going to close the gap and then uh, <clears throat> close conjunctiva and move on to the medial rectus recession. So that's the basic uh, uh, procedure. Uh, the, uh, uh, as I say, we began to do more of them. Colleagues at children started doing them as well. And uh, we uh, were able, sort of had a natural experiment because some people were doing medial rectus recession, some were doing superior rectus transposition. So we had a much greater improvement, significant improvement in esotropia and an abduction compared with medial rectus recession, we had a more stable long-term outcome. And part of this was it allows for recessing a tight medial at the same time as you're transposing and placing an adjustable suture. So, but the question people have is at what cost do you get that better abduction, less surgery? And there are risks. So the first that people worry about is torsional diplopia. Now that's exceedingly rare. And we, in fact, while you do get in torsion often of the eye, it's not enough to cause double vision in almost any case. It just hasn't been an issue. Next is new onset vertical diplopia. There is a risk of that. 
Uh, Linda Doggy, uh, Anna Escudere, and colleagues at Children's have an article in press at JA Post looking at our uh, at our experience over uh, more than a decade and found a 7% incidence of vertical diplopia. Uh, we, there's also a concern of getting overcorrection with diplopia in adduction. Uh, that's an espe especially a problem when you're doing the first operation in adults who've never known what exotropia is like. They hate it when they be, have any amount of exotropia. I think there may be a risk of getting overcorrections in children under age one as well. So what I've learned in the 13 years of doing superior rectus transposition plus medial rectus recession, first pre-op counseling is key. We want to advise that, that, that the slightly higher risk of a vertical deviation is the price of getting a better result. I think adjustable sutures on this are a must because of the unpredictable nature. We wanna target a slight undercorrection in adults to avoid the exotropia in, um, in uh, the field of action of the muscle. I well, use an augmentation suture, but not always, only when I really feel like I need that extra boost. Uh, watch out, especially if the lateral rectus muscle is tight, uh, that, that can pull the superior rectus muscle down laterally and, and limit your elevation. And if you have trouble, don't forget, you can always remove that uh, augmentation suture at your post-op assessment. And then beware of patients who have a hyperdeviation in primary position preoperatively. If there's a hypertrophy, you can anticipatorily recess the superior rectus muscle. If there's a hypo, you can, instead of augmenting, you can reset the muscle. So that is my uh, quick summary. I have uh, about, uh, back in 2012, we did an hour webcast on that that's still available. We did a, uh, recently did a review of all the transposition procedures in Duane syndrome. So that is uh, my presentation and thanks again for uh, including me. Thank you, uh, David and Steve. Uh, it was a great talk, uh, almost uh, dealing with the similar thing. Uh, Steve, thank you for that universal. I think, uh, as I said in the beginning, we are the Vasudeva Kutumakam, the one world is one family. Right now in this difficult time, let's take care of this world society. I think we will still remain world society of pediatric ophthalmology and services. Thank you very much for that comment. Uh, in the meantime, I'll be changing uh, two more questions on the menti.com. You all can see two more questions coming up. I will show the answers later. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Kylie. There is an online question uh, for Dr. Kyle. Uh, the question is, any conservative management for uh, Duvan syndrome without non-surgical management? They would like to hear. Well, I think the options are limited, but it really depends on the specific specific clinical presentation. I mean, obviously, you have to do the cycloplegic refraction to make sure that you don't have an accommodative component. Uh, some people have reported successful management with PRISM, and I think that's reasonable, but probably doesn't apply in many cases. Um, when you have a larger deviation, Prisms aren't going to work very well for that uh, because it's going to be difficult to uh, put that amount of prism in a pair of glasses. And really, surgical uh, management is going to be better when you get deviations that are 10 or more, maybe even eight, eight and larger. Um, and when you have the very small deviations with minimal head turns, I think one of the things we have to remember about Duane syndrome, I mean, this is a true congenital strabismus. And I think it's very common that these patients have a uh, foveal suppression. They're monofixators essentially. And uh, even if they have a head turn and appear to be orthophoric in that head posture, they, in my experience, rarely have perfect stereopsis. They've got that little foveal scotoma. So when the angle is small, which makes prism correction reasonable as an option. I think usually these patients are doing pretty well on their own and can just be observed. And then of course, uh, you know, I don't think that any type of orthoptic therapy is going to really make a difference here because of the innervational issues and the mechanical issues with these patients. We're just not going to overcome that with standard um, orthoptic type of therapy. Um, but it, actually, if I may, I wanted to uh, 
ask the speakers, you know, Steve brought up the fact that this is a condition, there's no one size fits all. There's not a set procedure for a specific type of Duane syndrome that's going to work in all cases. And there's a combination of innervational and mechanical factors at play here. I was wondering if anyone does anything extra in the preoperative phase to determine how much is innervational versus mechanical. In other words, is anyone doing uh, high resolution imaging? Is anyone looking at psychotic velocities uh, before they form a surgical plan? Or is it really mostly, you know, the list that Steve presented to us where you've got your primary position measurement, your duction deficits, uh, retraction and all the rest? So, uh, Steve, you want to take it quickly before we move on to the next question? Well, I think um, she's hit on a number of uh, very good points, and uh, each of those points could uh, take up a, a lot of time discussing. But I think a lot of it also, you mentioned, alluded to, would be the force duction testing. And uh, I find that that's very helpful. Um, and especially, you may not be able to get that information until surgery or in a very cooperative adult, uh, but uh, certainly looking at the dynamic of the movements from abduction to adduction, the up and down shoots and so on, um, and then the force ductions at the time of surgery are gonna be very important. And I would say both abduction and adduction, doesn't matter which ESO or EXO or ortho duanes, but, ESO, uh, but abduction and adduction are both important to test as well as the torsional ductions uh, before you make a decision on the table. Thank you, Steve. Uh, there is one specific question for Dr. Hunter. In which cases you will not perform superior rectus transposition in esotropic Joanne? Well, one place where I, I haven't been using it very often when there's bilateral uh, Duane syndrome because the bilateral patients, there's less of a need to, uh, to sort of balance right versus left gaze. So I don't feel like like maybe you get more, if you need it secondarily, maybe then you would do that. Uh, I will be especially careful if there is a pre-existing vertical deviation. Um, uh, but uh, uh, even in those cases, sometimes I am still using, uh, doing that. Um, I do watch if, if, there's a, if there's a large V or A pattern ahead of time, I'm also maybe uh, cautious about doing it. Although in Linda Doggy's review, both V and A patterns uh, tended to get better with the transposition, so even they're not. So um, uh, I, I do tend to use it quite a lot because I really like the abduction that we get. But actually in smaller angles, when there's a smaller angle, and this is uh, in conflict with Steve's advice, which says he only uses the resection when it's a large angle, if it's a small angle, I kind of like using just the little resection and a little recession because you can kind of boost abduction there. So that would be another possibly a situation, but most of the time I, I operate. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think we need to move on. Uh, I invite uh, Dr. Yair Mora to uh, present his case followed by I request uh, Dr. Dai to comment on that case after that. Thank you so much. In the meantime, people can still answer the menti.com questions. The code is 956535. Hey, do you see my slide? Yes, we can see it. Go ahead, please. Excellent. Thank you. So thank you, Ramesh. And I'm going to speak now about co-contraction or attraction in, in, in isotropic Duane and tell you where it can really bite you. And uh, actually, this is, this is a, a case that I had in my clinic, which started very regularly. A 16-year-old girl with known isotropic Duane's, 25 diopters of isotropia in primary, head turn of about 20 degrees, abduction deficit of minus four, and adduction deficit of minus one, with pre-traction, which I just ignored at that time. And, what I, I, I took her to the operating room. What I did was what I used to do then by, by media recession of the media rectus, uh, which uh, in the right eye I did five millimeters, in the left eye, the, in the Duane's eye, a bit less, about four and a half millimeters. And three days post-op, she's also 
no head turn, the abduction improved, mild limitation of abduction, and everybody's happy. But then a month later, I get a phone call from the mother and she says she, she has double vision. She's turning her head to the other side and something happened to her eye doctor. Please, you want to come, you, you need to see her. And uh, they came to the office and what I saw was uh, an overcorrection, uh, adduction deficit, not abduction, adduction deficit in the left eye of minus three, abduction deficit of minus one, the head turn is on to the other side, to the right side, and she has 30 diopters of exo for near and 25 for distance. And two weeks later, it got even worse, 50 diopters of exo for near and minus four abduction in the left eye. And uh, this is how she looked. This is when she, this is in the primary position. And this is how she looks when you're trying to look to the right. There's minus four adduction in the Duane's eye, the left eye. So, and on the other hand, to the other side, the abduction was fairly good, almost normal. So this is the picture of me at that point. And I was thinking maybe it's a slipped muscle, I don't know. So I had an urgent CT of the orbits and the muscle looks fine and healthy. So I took her to the OR and I decided to advance the right medial uh, rectus back to the original position and to advance the left medial from four and a half millimeters where there was no slippage, the muscle looks fine, to two millimeters. And after that, he was also in primary, mild limitation in abduction and adduction, but we, I got, a, I got a, a shy smile from the mother. But a month later, the eye is not moving again. I get another phone call. And this is how she looks. This is the primary position. This is when she's looking to the right. You see that the, the limitation in abduction uh, returned. The eye is not moving across the midline. And the abduction looks fairly good. So at this point, this is my picture at this point. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Lucky for me, I had Steve Kraft to uh, get together to get an advice from. And he suggested that that may be due to the co-contraction of the lateral rectus. And actually what we need to do now is recess the lateral rectus which we never do actually in, in isotropic Duane's. And I took it to the OR and I advanced the medial in the Duane's eye back to the original insertion. And I recessed both laterals, eight millimeters, and putting one uh, muscle on, on an adjustable sutures. And on the a day after the, the surgery on adjustment, I had to push the, the, the muscle a little bit further to 10 millimeters. And this is how she looked also in primary, nice abduction and mildly limited abduction. But a month later, he still looked fine. Okay, so what did I learn from this, uh, from this story? Recessing the medial in Duane's is a risky business. The medial rectus is weak because some of the muscle fibers are gone or fibrotic and it gets less innervation because some of the innervation from the oculomotor, oculomotor nerve goes to the lateral rectus. And because of the co-contraction of the, of the lateral rectus, it, it has, a, it, it's very difficult for the medial rectus sometimes to do abduction. So one of the lessons I learned from this case is from the, and also from other cases, is never recess the medial rectus in isotropic brain more than four and a half millimeters. And look for the strong co-contraction. Look at the picture here. You see that the, the eye is not only not moving across the midline, but also goes up in the upshoot. And this is because it, this upshoot was, was not present before the operation. This is because of the co-contraction of the lateral rectus. It was masked by a, a fibrotic medial rectus. And after recessing this, this medial rectus, it, uh, it showed and it actually prevented the eye from moving to adduction. And it caused a very large overcorrection. So how to identify these patients? 
Um, first of all, you have to look at the co-contraction, but also there is a very good article from Federico Velez who examined these, these patients and what he suggested is two signs. First of all, if you see the isotropia greater for distance than near, then you have to think about co-contraction. And the other thing, which is I, I think is a very nice uh, thing to try and do with your patients is to do cover test in adduction of the of the Duane's eye. And if you do cover test in, cover test in adduction and you get an exo, beware of co-contraction. That's a very important sign. And actually, in the in the, in the, the book about uh, the clinical service management, which actually is available available now for free in Google Books, there's a chapter on Duane syndrome by Arthur Jampolsky, and he has a very nice diagram showing how you can get totally different effects of the same recession of four and a half millimeters in different patients with Duane dependent on their co-contraction. And that's it, thank you. Stop sharing. Thank you so much, uh, Yair, for the nice case. Uh, Sean, do you have any comment? What is your preferred muscle to go in the re-surgeries? Uh, a very good talk, uh, Yair, and uh, you, you always already answer the question I'm gonna ask you. I personally do not normally do a, a bimedial recession uh, because in particular in the context with cold contraction, when the lateral rectus is tight, you know, unless you relax the lateral rectus, uh, whatever you do on the media is always risky because we have mechanical issue plus the innovational overdrive, particularly with the, with the lateral rectus. And uh, you should very well. And uh, the other thing I learned is also the media rectus, the recession amount often more effective compared to a normal virgin muscle in other cases. So, um, because if you see your presentation after your surgery, both the media rectus edge show some adduction deficit, in particular in the right eye as well. So this, it's kind of word inside. To me, you really got to get on with the lateral rectus recession to get rid of the cool contraction and upper shoot in particularly. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a great uh, case and uh, we always bore our hands on uh, one day. Prize, because if you recess the contralateral media rectus, now you have fixation to rest, you're increasing the tonus to this medial, that means you're increasing the tonus to this lateral, which means you're activating the lateral and activating the co-contraction. So and I've actually seen cases where the uh, medial rectus recession led to a vertical deviation on the opposite side, and it was fixed by advancing the contralateral medial rectus muscle back to reduce fixation to rest. So I'd just like to propose that as a possible cause for this surprise. Yes, thank you. But uh, I would like to ask you, David, what is your preferred method of dealing with patients with severe co-contraction and in, in isotropic veins? Still superior rectus transposition with the, a smaller, maybe, recession of the medial? Well, in younger patients, I will sometimes, uh, I, can, I think you can get away with recessing both the lateral and the medial and then transposing the superior rectus muscle. So I've done that in that webcast that I showed you. Uh, 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 I wouldn't necessarily do that in an older patient, but. Yeah. Uh, one of the thing, uh, the general question from online is, what is the maximum amount of medial rectus recession that can be performed in Duane syndrome? Any cutoff, Steve and David and I, Sean? I really, I really try not to go more than five and a half, especially when I'm doing the transposition. Every now and then, if I'm doing adjustable sutures and watching the, and I can see that there's still adduction, maybe I'll go up to six. But um, you know, five and a half, five, it's really best not to, because many of those patients in the in the on the spectrum that Steve describes, many of those patients have an adduction deficit that you don't really necessarily appreciate before surgery. 
Steve and Sean, quick comment. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I normally don't do more than five. And I want to share one experience. I have one child actually doing type one, uh, 25 prism of the Easter trope here. I did a media recession five plus uh, superior rectus foot and the transposition. After nine months, she developed secondary exotropia. And uh, so I just learned that uh, transposition of superior rectus plus media recession can be very effective. Uh, I think just be careful with the overcorrection. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I it's would agree. Go ahead, uh, Steve. Uh, now, I, I agree with David. You have to be very careful. But I go back to Kyle's uh, comments earlier. I think it depends on. Uh, the degree of retraction on the degree of up and down shoots and any of the lateral rectus abnormal phenomena. The more the lateral rectus uh, has these abnormal phenomena, the less I would be inclined to recess the medial rectus. And uh, if there is stiffness of the lateral rectus on forced duction, you could be a setup for a synergistic divergence and a limitation of adduction. And so I tend to be also conservative, no more than five and a half at the most six but it depends also on the dynamic of the horizontal movements and the um, tension and force duction readings of lateral and medial rectus at the time of surgery. One more question for uh, David. Uh, do you see what's the effect of uh, superior rectus transposition on retraction of the flow? Does it worsen? No it definitely effect? does not help. Um, so it doesn't help with the globe retraction, and I, um, uh, it's, it probably stays, I would say it probably stays about the same in most cases. Um, I, I, I uh, yeah, I, that's, that's usually what I advise parents. And so if there is a lot of concern about globe retraction, that might be another reason I would, I would uh, consider whether, uh, whether to do superior rectus transposition, because I know it's not going to make it better. And, and if the, regarding the amount of recession, when I combine superior rectus and medial, if, if the patient wakes up and there's any exotropia, any even hint of exotropia, then I'll resedate them and, and pull that medial back up most of the way. Two more questions before we go on to Ahmed's talk. One is for uh, Steve. Do you do only resection in small angle isotropia in Duan? Only resection. Um, I've done I've done two cases as second procedures uh, when there was an undercorrection as long as the medial recession was very small and I have to check that at the time of surgery. Um, but um, I haven't done it as a primary procedure, but I know some people have. And I think that if you have an easel under the 25 diopters cutoff that I gave you in my talk, uh, I suppose it's something reasonable as long again, as it's not at the spectrum end of co-contraction and limited adduction and so on. Um, so if you have a uh, small angle with minimal lateral rectus co innervation and mechanical issues, I think it would be safe to do. So I haven't done it as a primary procedure, but uh, I don't see why it couldn't be done. And the nice thing about this procedure, as I mentioned, is it's reversible and doesn't create new problems. And I, I'm sorry to take a minute, I just wanna tell our younger colleagues that you're learning about a large number of different, very complicated procedures in this uh, webinar. It's not a bad thing also to go to the tried and true simpler um, methods that uh, give you a lot of second options. And you're, you've heard about uh, uh, you know, various uh, situations where you've had to go and do reoperation. Don't forget that the primary procedure, if you do a more simple, straightforward operation, it gives you a lot of options if you have to do something more or to reverse it. So a small resection of the lateral as a primary procedure gives you lots of options if you have to add to it, subtract from it, and you probably won't create any new problems that will make the problem more complex. The final question is about coexistent hyperopia in isotropic duan. What's the effect of that? Uh, fortunately, we had, when I did my fellowship in UCLA, we saw that four cases and we have published. It corrected the esotopia as well as abnormal head posture. So that's very, very important. Kylie, uh, any uh, last comment on coexistent hyperopia and esotopia correction? Do you have anything? Um, 
I think nothing that was wasn't already said. Um, it, it definitely, I've seen several cases that have done very well with glasses and avoided surgery altogether, unless they also happen to have a severe globe retraction uh, or upshoots and downshoots. But uh, uh, yeah, it's definitely something that has to be ruled out. You know, I'm wondering I if I can ask a question. Um, uh, probably, probably we'll take it after the next okay. talk. Uh, we'll okay. take it definitely. So yeah, go ahead, please. To invite uh, Ahmed uh, Awadin from Cairo to speak about exotropic way. Go ahead, Ahmed. Hello, everyone. Surgery for exotropic brain syndrome aims to achieve satisfactory alignment in the primary position and to eliminate globe retraction and vertical shoot. Satisfactory alignment implies orthophoria in the primary position, elimination of the first turn with the largest possible binocular field of vision. My talk will be about how to address alignment while the third achievers talk will be about the vertical shoot. Small angle is best managed with a unilateral lateral rectus muscle recession, but for a larger angle, you probably do need to do, add, to do or add something more. A single lateral rectus can be done for up to 20 present diopters exotropia, but practically it would correct up to 15 present diopters, leaving a tiny acceptable undercorrection. The question is which lateral rectus muscle should be addressed. The main problem of ft lateral lateral rectus recession is the limitation of abduction, which is usually mild with a small amount of recession. But with larger amount of recession, it becomes severe and disfiguring to the patient. This is particularly important in type 3 brain syndrome, where the abduction is already limited, so the recession would limit it even more. In such cases, it might be more reasonable to do a contralateral lateral rectus recession. For larger angles, over 20 present diopters, the standard is to do a bilateral lateral rectus recession. But in only a few instances, you can do an ipsilateral meter rectus resection or even a lateral rectus periosteal fixation particularly if the lateral rectus is very tight or in the setting of a synergistic diversion. The choice of surgery depends on several factors, the most important of which are the degree of limitation of abduction and the degree of global distraction, the first of which is the degree of abduction with only a mild limitation of abduction of the right side, left lateral rectus recession would result in weakened abduction of the sound eye, which will increase the innervational impulses to the lateral rectus of the sound eye, and hence to the medial rectus of the Duane eye. This will help to improve the alignment of the Duane eye and will improve the face turn. On the other hand, if the limitation of the abduction is markedly limited, such as in this patient, contralateral lateral rectus recession might not be helpful because it will weaken the abduction of the sound eye. And because the abduction of the green eye is already markedly limited, now the patient will have a complete limitation of the left gaze. So for this patient, for example, there might be little improvement or even worsening of the first turn because of the inability of the patient to look to the left side. The second factor that should be considered is the degree of globe retraction. If the globe retraction is only very minimal, this might encourage you to add a small meter rectus retraction. So to summarize, for myself, if the eye can easily cross the midline, I probably will proceed to a bilateral lateral rectus recession. But if the abduction is markedly limited or is not expected to improve after if the lateral lateral rectus recession, I would either do a lateral rectus orbital wall fixation or a medial rectus resection, depending on the degree of the globe retraction. Finally, for the surgical technique, one might consider doing a limbal approach in such cases, probably to allow some conjunctival recession. The surgical dose should be increased because you need larger dose of surgery, and you should always do a forced reduction test after this insertion of the muscle and make sure the set is uh, negative. If still positive, one should look for fibrotic bands or accessory muscles such as this, which need to be removed in order to ensure a negative forced reduction test. For bilateral surgery, one might consider doing an asymmetrical lateral rectus recession with more lateral rectus recession on the sound eye in order to address the encounter. For medial rectus resection, we are talking only about a small amount of resection, usually in the range of four millimeters. 
Finally, for the lateral rectus orbital wall fixation, the technique is usually done through a limbal approach. The muscle is hooked and then secured with 5-0 polyester suture. The muscle is then disinserted from the sclera. And then using two instruments, the soft tissue overlying the orbital periosteum are pushed or displaced until the white periosteum is seen. The 5-0 polyester sutures are then passed through the periosteum and the muscle is pulled all the way to the orbital wall. Remember that you need to suture the intermuscular septum between the muscle and the sclera to avoid reattachment of the muscle to the sclera in such cases. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmed, for this uh, marvelous talk. And I would like to go ahead with the next talk and then we'll have a discussion, is that okay? And I would like to, uh, to invite Virinder Chernagwa from India to tell us about vertical, de vertical deviations in Duane syndrome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Morad. Uh, I hope my slides are visible. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Morad, once again. Uh, so I'll be talking a little bit about management of vertical strabismus in Duane retraction syndrome. We know that DRS is primarily associated with horizontal deviations, but vertical deviations do coexist. As Dr. Steve said in the beginning, it's a spectrum of conditions. And it, these vertical deviations are much more common in patients who have type 2 and type 3 DRS, patients who tend to have significant overshoots and possibly more common with exotropic DRS. So let us see the relation between the overshoots and the vertical deviations. So we know that classically the overshoots could be either mechanical type which occurs due to the leash effect exerted by the tight lateral rectus. And uh, as you can see in this video, in this patient, we can observe that as soon as the patient starts adducting, we can see a sudden abrupt, abrupt upshoot of the eyeball. The vertical deviations in these patients actually tend to be relatively small in the primary position, but increase on attempted adduction. In contrast, in patients who have an innervational overshoot, the Overshoot is due to the overaction of the inferior oblique or the superior rectus muscle. And these tend to be actually much more gradual. In this patient, focus on the right eye of the patient. As the patient is adducting, we can see a more gradual upshoot of the eyeball. However, vertical deviations in these patients tend to be more significant in primary gaze itself and could be to the tune of 20 to 25 prism diopters. One can also carefully look at the fundus and the presence of excyclotorsion would give clues that whether the inferior oblique is overacting in these patients. And in the spectrum, there could be some patients where there could be a mixed type of the overshoots. So with this, we move to three different scenarios in management of vertical squint in DRS. In this first example, we can see a young lady with left eye type 3 DRS. We can see a moderate amount of exotropia and about 18 prisms left hypertropia. There is about 3 plus upshoot and it is relatively abrupt in onset. However, she also had a cyclotorsion of the left eye and intraoperatively the lateral rectus was 3 plus tight. So we suspected a mixed mechanism overshoot with vertical squint and patient underwent left eye LR recession, Y split of lateral rectus as well as IO recession. Postoperatively, we can see that there was good improvement in exotropia, vertical deviation as well as the upshoot. Coming to the second scenario, in this patient we again with left eye type 3 DRS, we can see that there is relatively small exotropia with large hypertropia in primary case. There was also a DVD and upshoot. In this patient, we suspected superior rectus could be anomalous and intraoperatively the superior rectus was displaced temporarily. Therefore, we did a small LR recession, superior rectus recession and the nasalization of the displaced superior rectus and postoperatively there were good uh, there was good alignment in primary case as well as improvement in the upshoots coming to the last scenario 
In this patient with right eye type 3 DRS, we can see primarily an exotropia and only a small right hypertropia. There is a marked uh, overshoot to the tune of grade 4 and globe retraction. We suspected primarily mechanical overshoot and did only the lateral rectus recession with wide split of the lateral rectus. Postoperatively, there is improvement in exotropia and overshoots, but we can see that the hypertropia is as it is. So given this, retrospectively, we were thinking what else we could have done. The thought that comes to our mind is that we could possibly downshift the split lateral rectus by half to one tendon with in the hypertropic eye, which can possibly correct the small associated vertical squint also. So to conclude, look at the associated type of the overshoot, look at the amount of the deviation. In patients with mechanical overshoot, we can do the downshift of the split lateral rectus. In patients with innervational or mixed mechanism upshoots, we can do the look for the excycler torsion and do a IO surgery. And if it is absent, we can manage the, we can look for the position of the superior rectus as well as the tightness of superior rectus and we can add the superior rectus procedures. There can be other procedures also which we can discuss further. And at this, I would like to conclude the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Virender and Ahmed, uh, for the nice talk. We covered uh, most part of exotropic uh, Duvan syndrome. Uh, surprisingly, it's more common in East than West. The exotropic is much more common. Nowadays, I'm seeing much more exotropic Duvan than esotropic. And it has some peculiarities. It's seen more in males and there are some peculiar factors out there. The, the question uh, for Ahmed is, when do you do periosteal fixation only? And if you do periosteal fixation, do you do partial rectus transposition? When you are answering that question, I am having the final two menti questions for the audience, which will be displayed on their mobile phone. So please go ahead and answer. Ahmed, over to you. For myself, for myself I do the lateral rectus periosteal fixation only when the angle is very large and when the lateral rectus is very tight with marked fixation of adductions. In such cases, I don't expect that the patient will develop a consecutive esotropia after surgery. So for this reason, I usually don't do a vertical muscle transposition. I would rather wait and just do the periosteal fixation and see the patient later on. I would probably consider the periosteal fixation if I'm operating on a smaller angle or a milder limitation of abduction, which is not my case. Okay. Uh, any other question? Yeah. Do you want to ask? Kyle, you're saying something? Yes. Um, actually, Verinda partially addressed my question. A lot of, uh, quite a few Duane syndrome patients have unusual alphabetical patterns. X pattern, lambda, Y patterns. Um, I was wondering uh, how everyone might modify their surgery, uh, especially if the pattern that they have preoperatively is resulting in an unacceptable alignment in down gaze. Um, any comments from surgeons? For example, like the X pattern where you have the primary position alignment is actually pretty good, but you have a large exotropia and down gaze. I thought, um, go ahead, Ahmed, you go ahead. No, I was just thinking that I would probably won't do anything for such patients with an X pattern and align, the alignment in the primary position. I don't think that um, I might consider doing surgery for him. Uh, Kyle, I, I, I've had a number of these patients, and it just shows again to uh, uh, come to the point that there's such a spectrum of these problems. I find that a lot of these uh, A, V, and X patterns are related to lateral rectus co innervation with the other third nerve innervated muscles. I mean, it's a third nerve disinnervation with various contributions of the third nerve branches to other muscles. And I think you have to analyze exactly as um, Ahmed was saying and uh, Verinder about uh, looking for innervation and mechanical uh, issues. And I've treated these A patterns. Uh, if I found a tight lateral, what I've done is offset them down to where they're a little bit, uh, as you would treat an A or V pattern, but by offsetting them, maybe a full tendon width where you get the extra action and down gaze because 
as we all know, that's a very important field of gaze as opposed to up gaze. So I've handled that a lot by lateral rectus offsetting. And um, in some cases, you also get vertical muscles involved and I've offset the superior rectus muscles laterally or nasally or the inferior rectus to try and capture a vertical that is co-innervated with the lateral in certain gazes. So I think strategizing by offsetting muscles, especially the lateral, which is usually the, the crime, <laughs> usually the, uh, the, the culprit, um, can go a long way to treating some of those. Uh, request everyone to answer the Menti question. The seventh question is going on, and then the eighth question will come. In the meantime, uh, there is one more question for Virender. When do you specifically do inferior oblique weakening? If you do inferior oblique weakening, what is your procedure of choice in uh, vertical duet? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I think uh, I try to assess more carefully for both the pattern of the overshoot. Also, I try to look for the excycler torsion. If I can see a excycler torsion preoperatively, I am relatively sure that it is inferior oblique is tight. And if I'm suspecting that it could be mixed mechanism, one possible way could be that we could do the lateral rectus precession and Y split and again do the traction test after doing that. And the intraoperative at that point of time, we would have taken away the effect of the tight lateral rectus. And if it is still positive, possibly we can go ahead. Another approach in such a situation could be that we could stage the procedures. We can do the lateral rectus recession with Y split and then reassess and do the infraoblique later on. As regards the procedure of choice, I think infraoblique recession is my procedure of choice and I try to do it the, to the parts point. Just uh, summarizing for the audience's sake, whenever there is a esotropia with the less of a retraction, small angle, you can get away with just medial rectal recession, or you can add resection to improve the abduction. But whenever there is more of a co-contraction and retraction, you can add, along with medial rectus recession, you can add superior rectus transposition, the published uh, report says that the complication is very minimal because most of the questions here looks like they are worried about uh, torsion. I will ask two more questions for David after this. In terms of exotropic juan, the unilateral or bilateral, symmetrical or asymmetrical works very well for most of the exotropic juan. But in extreme overshoots and things like that, you really need to fix the lateral lectus to the periosteum. And whenever we have vertical Juvan syndrome, you have an option of Y splitting for mild vertical deviation. For innovational, we need to tackle on inferior oblique. And if there is just a mechanical with the tight superior rectus, you can do a superior rectus recession. Having said that, uh, uh, I ask once again everyone to complete the Menti question. If they have not, I will show that question now. There is one specific question for David. What is the effect of superior rectus transposition on ptosis? Second related question is uh, small isotropia with severe co-contraction. Will you do superior rectus transposition? Uh, the position of the eyelid does not, I have not seen it change. Now, transiently after surgery, parents can be worried because you will see um, some swelling because of having worked around the superior rectus muscle, but that has gone away. I can't, I can't remember a case where the uh, where the ptosis was an issue. As far as the severe co-contraction, in uh, again in a in a child, well, you know, if you if you don't, you you certainly have to weaken the medial. That's going to help some. And then the question is whether you want to also weaken the lateral. And if you weaken both the medial and the lateral, now you're going to have a problem with primary gaze. And so that's when, uh, again, I know that people are worried about anterior segment ischemia, and uh, I know it can happen, but if, you, if you're doing fornix uh, uh, incisions and you're leaving the inferior rectus muscle alone and you're um, you know, being gentle and careful, then you can also transpose the superior rectus muscle laterally. Uh, at the same time. Now, even for small angle Duanes, you mentioned that 
uh, you can just do a medial rectus recession. But I'm always sad when I've just done a medial rectus recession because you never get any, you don't get any abduction. And, and I'm just so used now to getting some improvement in abduction. And no, it's not usually normal, but even, even going from a minus four to a minus three, patients really appreciate that little bit of a difference. One related question, do you do only superior rectus transposition in that case? If there is a small deviation, yes. just a superior rectus, okay. Especially if the medial is not super tight, uh, yeah. if, it's, if it's possible. And I see yeah. Steve is gonna modify my answer. Yeah, Steve has a comment. Before that, there is a friendly question for Steve. Uh, do you ever perform superior rectus transposition? If not, why not? Uh, I don't like to throw uh, water onto a very good presentation. I've had, uh, I've done a few uh, superior rectus transpositions, but I've had some bad experiences with them, creating uh, unwanted verticals that, uh, and yet I've, you know, I took pictures of the procedure and I did it exactly the way our colleagues are doing them. And so um, I don't do them um, now, but um, I know in some hands it seems to work very, very well. Um, my alternative is actually if I have to do a transposition, I do a Hummelsheim, which is a half tendon transposition of the superior and inferior rectus. And I've never had any vertical complications or torsional issues, and it also spares some of the ciliary vessels. But I had another question for David. Have you ever tried the Nishida procedure, which is not detaching the superior rectus? but dragging the lateral uh, border over towards the lateral rectus, which our Japanese colleagues have popularized, that would eliminate the third rectus muscle in that scenario that you were describing where you've done the two horizontals. I mean, have you tried that as an option to a full tendon transposition? Yeah, and actually I'm really glad you brought that up because that does sound like a very reasonable thing to try in the situation that we just discussed where you have uh, severe globe retraction, you want to weaken both the medial and the lateral, but still want to gain some uh, outward force. That probably would be a case where uh, where I would try that, give that my first uh, try. I haven't yet though. And I have another question for David. You, you talked about the eliminating or taking out the, the foster suture on um, one day or two days after the operation. How do you do that in the, wait, in the waiting room after the operation or in the, in the clinic? Well, what is the procedure that you're doing? So my practice is to, uh, I'll do a surgery, then uh, I'll, the patient goes to the recovery room while, they'll, then while I'm doing the next surgery, the patient stays there. When I finish the second surgery, I go out and I check the alignment. And if there's a problem, uh, then I will, um, in an adult, I just uh, am able to, you know, do what I need to do. Now for the, for the, uh, uh, for the uh, augmentation suture, I leave it a little long so it's easy to find and pull, not, not easy, but easier to find and pull forward and cut. And Linda Doggy has actually been putting in uh, more than one suture so she can cut more than one and she's, we're preparing a series of that. For kids, uh, we have a protocol worked out with anesthesia where they'll come into the uh, into the recovery room area and sedate the patient. However, for many people, that's not a practical option. But if you uh, um, you know make the parents aware that this is a adjustable procedure, but that if you and what you're going to do is see the patient on post-op day one or two, if you're not happy, you bring them back to the OR on post-op you know the you know, within then another couple of days then you just need a 15 minute procedure. If you've already put the short tag noose on the medial, you can pull that. If you wanna cut the, the uh, uh, augmentation suture, you can do that. And in the, uh, in the 13 years, again, that we've been doing this, we had one case, it wasn't my patient, but uh, I think it was Linda's patient. And I think it's in her series, Linda Doggy's patient. Uh, she had one patient who complained of enough torsional diplopia that she went ahead and, uh, and cut the augmentation suture um, uh, otherwise, we have not had anybody uh, complaining of that. Just, just, just to emphasize, so you're doing, you, you're actually doing two or three augmentation sutures, and then you can release one or two. And that's, what, 
that's what she's doing. I have never tried that. Um, uh, I just put I, I put zero or one in. Um, if yeah. you're just starting and worried about getting funny verticals, then you can potentially leave that out. I think that may add to the to the uh, risk of getting uh, odd verticals. So if you're still, you know, if it's the first one you're trying, maybe you just do the transposition. Don't put the uh, don't put the augmentation suture in because you'll still get at least a little bit of abduction then in combination with the medial rectus recession. Yeah, yeah I, before I show the Menti results, there are two questions for you related to consecutive exotropia. Do you tackle medial rectus in resurgery when you have consecutive exotropia? The second question is, does the co-contraction or the globe retraction predict consecutive exotropia? When you are answering this question, I will uh, share the Menti results. Can, can you just repeat the, the second question? I didn't really understand. Does co amount of co-contraction and globe retraction predict consecutive exotropia? Yes. Okay. Well, the, the answer is yes. <laughs> if there is a severe co-contraction, you should be very worried about uh, consecutive exotropia. That's for sure. And uh, the first question about how do you tackle overcorrection? How do you tackle consecutive exotropia? Well, I think it's the obvious thing to do is just to reverse the, the uh, recession and advance the muscle, the medial muscle back. But as, as, you, show, as you saw in my presentation, you should also think about doing uh, lateral rectus recessions. And sometimes this is the only way to, to solve the problem. So although you may have a, a worsening abduction, if you have a, a, a consecutive exotropia and it's really bothersome for the patient, you should think about recessing the lateral as well. Okay, I will show the result now. The first question was, have you attended any previous webinars? Uh, many of them attended, but uh, some of them have recently attended the third webinar. The second question, the, the geographical location, most of them are from Asia. We have from Europe and North America, and then comes uh, South Africa and Australia. Obviously, it's very, very uh, late there, almost midnight. This is very interesting. My first surgical option for ET Duan. Uh, majority still says medial rectus recession, very few with VRT, and we can see recession and resection as we are, as I'm showing it, it's increasing. Some of them are answering right now. I will show after the webinar how it was. The first surgical option for our exotropic duan was uh, lateral rectus recession combined either symmetrical or asymmetrical. Still, people are answering this question. I hope some more people will answer. For the overshoot, most of the people do LR recession with Y split. Some people do Y split only. It depends probably on the condition. 25% uh, or 20% are not fellowship trained, so that's important to know. Most of them are fellowship trained people. This is interesting. The superior rectus transposition people have gone up, probably medial rectus has come down. I can also see the resection group. There is a small increase. The VRT remains the same. So this is, this is I think, uh, the effect of the discussion uh, we are having. And if you see the, the exotropia, it almost remains the same there. So there is no change as such. Thank you very much for uh, everybody to uh, answering this question. Uh, we have two to three minutes for uh, discussion. I would like uh, uh, Sean and Kyle to make respective comment on the surgical and non-surgical. Then Steve can comment. Yes, well, thanks, I... Ramesh. Sorry, go ahead, Kyle. I was just going to make a comment. Um, as an orthoptist, the patients that are referred to me are coming in because of overcorrection. They're adults coming in with overcorrection. Um, I think with uh, children, any 
any particular surgery you're going to do, if you get a little overcorrection, I think that they probably are going to do fine because they're going to have suppression. They're going to adapt to it. But adults, for the first time, having surgery on their Duane syndrome, um, they really hate the overcorrection. And I find that some of them, they're not necessarily overcorrected in primary, but they don't like losing the single vision that they had when the involved eye was in adduction. You know, um, so I, I would say, I wonder if anyone uh, adjusts their surgical plan based on the age of the patient at the first surgery. Do, do you keep this in mind and maybe prefer a staged procedure or just be more conservative when you have an adult? Does it make a difference to you? I pick up this uh, because I have done both children and adult with transposition and median recession for doings. For my adult patients, I did exactly what the caution you suggest. I actually just do a median recession with superior rectus transposition. I have never done recess or resect for adult with doings for the same reason. Uh, I think the more surgery you do, the more you learn you do not want overcorrect. In adult patients, they absolutely hate you. They will call you all the time and uh, that's a forgiven. So that's why I become more conservative for dealing with Duane syndrome in adult versus with children. In children, I often do a mid recession, sometimes do a lateral resection, as Dr. Kraft just mentioned uh, in his series. But uh, for adults, absolutely become very conservative, yeah. yeah. Steve can go ahead with the comment and then we need to probably cook yeah, close. Two comments. I think that uh, th this discussion just brings up the ash issue of the range of binocular single vision field. And the more you try to be aggressive in an adult, the more you could compromise, as Kyle was saying, the um, adduction to the other side. Uh, adults don't like to lose too much of that binocular field into the adducted uh, field. And so I think yeah, I think it does, uh, Kyle, to answer that, it does affect my surgical decisions for sure in terms of the goals and what I want to achieve for an adult specifically. Um, but I also had a question for Viru. Actually, it's a comment and I'm very interested in how the fact that you've included the inferior oblique weakening in your uh, toolbox as a reason, as a way of eliminating upshoots or hypertropias, because in some of the older textbooks, they mention specifically that the inferior oblique is rarely involved and in that recessing or weakening the inferior oblique rarely helps an upshoot in Duane's. And you beautifully uh, included the innervational and mechanical aspects. And I think that again, if our younger colleagues are reading some of the older textbooks, they may shy away from doing an inferior oblique weakening when it is actually indicated, as you nicely pointed out. And the EMGs I showed from Drs. Scott and Wong shows that the inferior oblique can be involved. It's a third nerve innervated muscle. It's an inferior division third nerve innervated uh, situation. And that's where the spectrum of Duane's can include the inferior oblique. So I'm glad you pointed that out because if you carefully look at the type of upshoot, uh, an inferior oblique weakening is very helpful. So I'm glad that you brought that up. Okay, uh, I'm sure, I'm afraid we have uh, any more time now. So we need to close. Um, I just want to make uh, some uh, announcement here. Some of you have been asking about uh, attendance and participation certificate. If you want, uh, you can send an email to WSPOS at WSPOS.org. We will uh, send the participation certificate to all of you. And uh, I want to uh, remind everyone, uh, we had uh, many countries, people from many countries uh, represented uh, today. So we have the upcoming uh, webinars. You can note down these uh, dates. All are on Saturday at the same time except that the next Sunday we have one more special edition for COVID-19, uh, the pediatric ophthalmology practice during that time. Uh, thank you everyone uh, around the world watching this uh, uh, live today. Uh, I hope uh, you all have uh, benefited. As I said in the beginning, it's teaching and learning together. That's what we have uh, done. And obviously many of you would have had some more questions to ask. You can still email them if you did not have an opportunity to ask within the next one hour. 
we will send them to the panel and we will send uh, their answers as a pdf form i really would like to thank uh, all the panelists and the speakers from uh, six countries today they have done uh, an amazing job uh, and we are uh, uh, finishing on time thank you so much for uh, giving your time uh, today i would like to thank the entire team for providing the platform uh, and arranging all the logistics about uh, the technical part of it thank you very much and last but not the least the, our wspos admin team have uh, done a wonderful job thank you so much and uh, have a great day uh, goodbye Thank you everyone. Uh it was nice having you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to see stay well and prosper. Thank you. <laughs>